the truth about Jesus. Is he a myth? By Mangersar Margarich Mangersarian. Read by Stephen Collins. The problem stated. Let me now give an idea of the method I propose to follow in the study of this subject. Let us suppose that a student living in the year 3000 desired to make sure that such a man as Abraham Lincoln really lived and did the things attributed to him. How would he go about it? A man must have a birthplace and a birthday. All the records agree as to where and when Lincoln was born. This is not enough to prove his historicity, but is an important link in the chain. Neither the place nor the time of Jesus' birth is known. There has never been any unanimity about this matter. There has been considerable confusion and contradiction about it. It cannot be proved that the 25th of December is his birthday. A number of other dates were observed by the Christian church at various times as the birthday of Jesus. The Gospels give no date, and appear to be quite uncertain, really ignorant about it. When it is remembered that the Gospels purport to have been written by Jesus' intimate companions and during the lifetime of his brothers and mother, their silence on this matter becomes significant. The selection of the 25th of December as his birthday is not only an arbitrary one, but that date, having been from time immemorial, dedicated to the Son, the inference is that the Son of God and the Son of Heaven enjoy the same birthday, or at one time identical beings. The fact that Jesus' death was accompanied with the darkening of the sun, and the date of his resurrection is also associated with the position of the sun at the time of the venereal equinox, is further intimation that we have in the story of the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus, an ancient and nearly universal sun myth, instead of verifiable historical events. The story of Jesus for three days in the heart of the earth, of Jonah three days in the belly of a fish, of Hercules three days in the belly of a whale, and of Little Red Riding Hood sleeping in the belly of a great black wolf, represent the attempt of primitive man to explain the phenomenon of day and night. The sun is swallowed by a dragon, a wolf, or a whale, which plunges the world into darkness. But the dragon is killed, and the sun rises triumphant to make another day. This ancient sun myth is the starting point of nearly all miraculous religions, from the days of Egypt to the 20th century. The story which Matthew relates about a remarkable star, which sailing in the air pointed out to some unnamed magicians the cradle or cave in which the wonder child was born, helps further to identify Jesus with the sun. What became of this performing star, or the magicians and their costly gifts, the records do not say. It is more likely that it was the astrological predilections of the gospel writer which led him to assign this godchild a star in the heavens. The belief that the star determined human destiny is a very ancient one. Such expressions in our language as ill starred, a lucky star, disaster, lunacy, and so on, indicate the hold which astrology once enjoyed upon the human mind. We still call a melancholy man, saturnine, a cheerful man, jovial, a quick-tempered man, mercurial, showing how closely our ancestors associated the movements of celestial bodies with human affairs. Note, Childhood of the World, Edward Claude. End note. The prominence, therefore, of the sun and stars in the gospel story tend to show that Jesus is an astrological rather than a historical character. That the time of his birth, his death, and supposed resurrection is not verifiable is generally admitted. This uncertainty robs the story of Jesus, to an extent at least, of the atmosphere of reality. The 25th of December is celebrated as his birthday, yet there is no evidence that he was born on that day. Although the Gospels are silent as to the date on which Jesus was born, there is circumstantial evidence in the accounts given of the event to show that the 25th of December could not have been his birthday. It snows in Palestine, though a warmer country, and we know that in December there are no shepherds tending their flocks in the night time in that country. Often at this time of the year, the fields and hills are covered with snow. Hence, if the shepherds sleeping in the fields really saw the heavens open and heard the angels' song, in all probability it was in some other month of the year, and not late in December. We know, also, that early in the history of Christianity, the month of May and June enjoy the honor of containing the day of Jesus' birth. Of course, it is immaterial on which day Jesus was born. But why is it not known? 
Yet not only is the date of his birth a matter of conjecture, but also the year in which he was born. Matthew, one of the evangelists, suggests that Jesus was born in King Herod's time. It was this king who, hearing from the Magi that a king of the Jews was born, decided to destroy him. But Luke, another evangelist, intimates that Jesus was born when Canarius was ruler of Judea, which makes the date of Jesus' birth about 14 years later than the date given by Matthew. Why this discrepancy in the historical document, to say nothing about inspiration? The theologian might say that this little difficulty was introduced purposely into the scriptures to establish its infallibility, but it is only religious books that are pronounced infallible on the strength of the contradictions they contain. Again, Matthew says that to escape the evil designs of Herod, Mary and Joseph, with the infant Jesus, fled into Egypt. Luke says nothing about this hurried flight, nor of Herod's intention to kill the infant Messiah. On the contrary, he tells us that after the forty days of purification were over, Jesus was publicly presented at the temple, where Herod, if he really, as Matthew relates, wished to seize him, could have done so without difficulty. It is impossible to reconcile the flight into Egypt with their presentation in the temple, and this inconsistency is certainly insurmountable, and makes it look as if the narrative had no value whatever as history. When we come to the more important chapters about Jesus, we meet with greater difficulties. Have you ever noticed that the day on which Jesus is supposed to have died falls invariably on a Friday? What is the reason for this? It is evident that nobody knows, and nobody ever knew the date on which the crucifixion took place if it ever took place. It is so obscure and so mythical that an artificial day has been fixed by the ecclesiastical councils. While it is always on a Friday that the crucifixion is commemorated, the week in which the day occurs varies from year to year. Good Friday falls not before the spring equinox, but as soon after the spring equinox as the full moon allows, thus making the calculation to depend upon the position of the sun and the zodiac and the phases of the moon. But that was precisely the way the day for the festival of the pagan goddess Osteria was determined. The pagan Osteria has become the Christian Easter. Does not this fact, as well as those already touched upon, make the story of Jesus to read very much like the stories of a pagan deity? The early Christian, Origen, for instance, in his reply to the rationalist Celsus, who questioned the reality of Jesus, instead of producing evidence of a historical nature, appealed to the mythology of the pagans to prove that the story of Jesus was no more incredible than those of the Greeks and Roman gods. This is so important that we refer our readers to Origen's own words on the subject. Before replying to Celsus, it is necessary to admit that in the matter of history, however true it might be, writes his Christian father, it is often very difficult and sometimes quite impossible to establish its truth by evidence which shall be considered sufficient. Note. Origin, Contra Celsae, 1, 58. End note. This is a plain admission that as early as the 2nd and 3rd centuries, the claims put forth about Jesus did not admit of positive historical demonstration. But in the absence of evidence, Origen offers the following metaphysical arguments against the skeptical Celsus. 1. Such stories as are told of Jesus are admitted to be true when told of pagan divinities. Why can they not also be true when told of the Christian Messiah? 2. They must be true because they are the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. In other words, the only proof Origen can bring forth against the rationalistic criticism of Celsus is that to deny Jesus would be equivalent to denying both the pagan and Jewish mythologies. If Jesus is not real, says Origen, then Apollo was not real, and the Old Testament prophecies have not been fulfilled. If we are to have any mythology at all, he seems to argue, why object to adding to it the myths of Jesus? There could not be a more damaging admission than this from one of the most conspicuous defenders of Jesus' story against early criticism. Justin Martyr, another early church father, offers the following argument against unbelievers in a Christian legend. When we say also that the word, which is the first birth of God, was produced without sexual union, and that he, Jesus Christ, our teacher, was crucified, died, and rose again, and ascended into heaven, we propound nothing different from what you believe regarding those whom you esteem sons of Jupiter. Note, First Apology, Chapter 21, Antinicene Library, End Note, which is another way of saying that the Christian mythos 
is very similar to the pagan, and should be therefore be equally true. Pressing his argument further, this interesting father discovers many resemblances between what he himself is preaching, and what the pagans have always believed. For you know how many sons your esteemed writers ascribe to Jupiter, Mercury, the interpreting word, he spells this word with a small w, while in the above quotation he uses a capital W to denote the Christian incarnation, and teacher of all, Asclepius, who ascended to heaven, one Hercules, and Perseus, and Bellerophon, who, though sprung from mortals, rose to heaven on the horses of Pegasus. If Jupiter can have, Justin Martyr seems to reason, half a dozen divine sons, why cannot Jehovah have at least one? Instead of producing historical evidence or appealing to credible documents, as one would to prove the existence of a Caesar or an Alexander, Justin Martyr draws upon pagan mythology in his reply to the critics of Christianity. All he seems to ask for is that Jesus be given a higher place among the divinities of the ancient world.